who are you, what do you do, and where are you from? Okay, my name is Kathy Wapipa Ishapi. I originally was born in Winnebago, Nebraska. That's where my mother's people are from. And then as I was growing up, we moved to Oklahoma and we spent most of our time in Oklahoma because my dad's family was from there and my mother's mom came to live with us. Okay. So I had all my grandparents in Shawnee, Oklahoma mm -hmm. uh, around us all the time. And in that way, we were really lucky. So growing up in Shawnee, of course, I went to the University of Oklahoma. And then after I started to work, I had lots of opportunities that just kept coming up in different places. It was like, if I imagined it was fun to work in a place, then somehow a job would mm -hmm. come open and I took advantage of all those. Yeah. That eventually took me all over the country. I worked on the East Coast in Connecticut for several years with the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, which I loved because, you know, in school we're told that they were all decimated. Mm -hmm. They weren't there anymore. And I found out that was a lot. Mm -hmm. They're there, they're thriving, they have strong culture. They have a strong indigenous identity, mm -hmm. and that was great for me to see and inspiring. Yeah. So, so in all those places, has the style um, of those different cultures influenced your work in any way? Absolutely. One of the things I've been so lucky to see is actually how things intersect, mm -hmm. how they're expressed in a similar way and how our ideas about who we are as indigenous people are really so common. Mm -hmm. our, our particular culture in a different location, they differ. Mm -hmm. But deep down, the way we express who we are as the original people of North America, it has so many strains that are common mm -hmm. amongst the different tribes. Languages are different. Yeah. And uh, the way we dress is different. And, Sometimes the kinds of dwellings we lived in, they're different, but there's still that common thread amongst all of them. Mm -hmm. And that was a great privilege for me to be able to travel enough yeah. so that I could really see that and yeah. really define that. Yeah. So in that way, we are still all connected. Yes, yeah. So what is your connection to Wanaskewin? Well, my connection to Wanaskewin was first as a visitor. So when I first came to, uh, Saskatchewan to live when my husband husband brought me here I thought it was so beautiful I just enjoyed coming out here and and, and enjoying the tranquility and just the atmosphere and seeing the beautiful things they had on display and I never in my mind imagined that someday I would be asked to contribute to the collection here and that became my next uh, connection to Wanuskewin and that was when I was asked to contribute to the collection here and I came out to meet with the curator and we started to plan what we were going to make and I thought you know it might be a few things and it turned out to be more than 50 yeah. items. Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty exciting for me but a little bit scary Yeah. because I was at that time I was a slow beater I always just took my time and I just you know, I had the picture here, and then I knew how I wanted it to look, so I just worked toward that mm -hmm. when I'm working. I don't worry about time or how long it takes or am I fast, am I slow. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, 50, that's a lot. And then I was thinking, you know, I might have to take time off from my other job mm -hmm. just to get them all done in the amount of time that we have. But guess what happened? A pandemic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I was already taking time yeah, off, yeah. right about the time that we started actually constructing the yeah. items. It was the pandemic, and we were home every day, and I worked on them every day. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? I came to be a faster beater. Mm -hmm. I was never fast, but now I'm fast. Yeah. And it gave me time to really reflect, and there was a thing happening in our home where Tim was working on his side of the items that are in the collection, and I was working on my side. My side tended to be the things that were beaded mm -hmm. or clothing or material kinds of items. Tim was working on tools mm -hmm. and a bow. He worked on a, the birch bark canoe. And so 
really seeing him and how he was manip manipulating his materials mm -hmm. and how he was of the how he was combining the materials he needed that really kind of inspired me to mm -hmm. add a little bit more to what I was doing so I didn't do just a standard flat beaded kind of items I thought what other materials that yeah. used to be so important to us should I be adding into the yeah. items that I'm making yeah and that really gave me an opportunity to add even more layers on to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had a small canvas, whatever I was making was the canvas, and through this canvas I wanted to tell a story. Mm -hmm. The story I wanted to tell was, what do we as Indigenous people think is vitally important to mm -hmm. our lives? And so I just set out to do that, and I did that with color, I did it with shapes, and design but also with those little bits of other materials that I added like shells, mm -hmm. bells, different color beads, bigger beads, fringes mm -hmm. and maybe with a little bit of uh, additional adornment that I just added to it including the way that I attached maybe two, two pieces yeah. of leather together instead of either sewing them together or seeing I attach them in an old traditional way, which is to just cut a little split in them and then you yeah. kind of weave them together yeah. so, and that makes them hold together. Yeah. I tried to think back to the ways that our, our great great grandmothers would have done things when they didn't have all the tools mm -hmm. we had. And so I wanted to also depict that. But in the images I used, I was really careful and uh, very serious about you know getting it right so I did do some research well what does this flower really look yeah. like well what is what does this one look that one look like and you know the mint leaves what is their shape yeah. because I needed to depict that in the things I was beating mm -hmm. because that's knowledge the pictures remind us of the stories mm -hmm. and so someday people can look at it and they'll know oh this looks like a mint leaf and it must have been really important to the people mm -hmm. and they'll maybe explore back and they'll find out we can never lose that information because the information about the medicines is a truth mm -hmm. yeah. and it can be hidden for a while but we can never lose it so as long as people are searching for it looking for it then they can always find it mm -hmm. they'll come back to us yeah and those are the things we're really needing now and yeah in the pandemic, we did go back to a lot of our medicines, mm -hmm. and we we searched, and people were sharing with each other. Well, this could work, that could work. Try this. This is how you're going to use mm -hmm. it, and that was a way that we were connecting through the pandemic. Even though we're home alone in our house, we're reaching out to other people and talking about these things and helping those medicines to come back to the people. So, yeah, every piece kind of has a story. It does. So, I have a question about a story that you may have about Kevin Costner. <laughs> have you have you worked um, with him, or have you, you've created pieces that I, he's I did, used? I did create a, one piece for Kevin Costner, and this came about kind of in a very roundabout way. My husband's uh, cousin, he was working with... Uh, the festival in uh, or right outside of Regina, mm. uh, Craven. Okay, yeah. yeah. He was working with that festival, and somehow he uh, he knew that Kevin Costner was going to bring his his mu musical group there mm -hmm. to perform, and so he came to see me and he said, "Kathy, I need a really fancy shirt for Kevin Costner," and I was like, "What?" Sure, I'll do it. <laughs> and so I pushed everything else aside and I worked on this shirt. It's a black cowboy shirt. And I kind of, well, this was kind of my thing before before I was beating so much. I um, would make these shirts for my husband, Timmy Shappy. He's an arena director at Pow Wows. And so I promised him when we first got together, I will make you a new shirt every time you're the arena mm -hmm. director. And I was like, oh no, he's like the arena director every yeah. week. <laughs> so I was making a lot of shirts. So I kind of had a process and had it down fast. So I just started making a shirt. But again, you know, what's the message? Yeah. What is this going to say? 
So a little bit, it has a teepee and it has some figures and an uh, Indian on a horse and other things that I think are beautiful. And I thought, I'm going to put these together, kind of reminiscent of the movie that mm -hmm. we all love, Dances with Wolves. And then on the front, I used just a geometric design. But in doing that, I was trying to represent all of my family. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, oh, my whole family would love to meet Kevin yeah. Foster. <laughs> so I'm just going to put them all on his shirt, and then I'm going to tell them, and yeah. they'll know. So I made the black satin shirt, which I usually won't make a black satin shirt for a man because it's it's so hard to work with. Mm -hmm. It's just like blinds me because it's dark. It just draws all all the colors in. And so I made the black shirt and I gave it to Tim's cousin. I personally never got to see Kevin Costner, but I do have the knowledge that yes. he has a shirt yeah. that I made. Oh yeah, and I embroidered on the inside, made by Kathy. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. very clever. That's yeah. so cool. So, um, I guess how did you how did you get into your practice? So was it just growing up around um, like well, different things, or like how did you get started? Remember, I said I we had one grandmother living with us. Yeah, and that was my ho chunk, Gaga. We mm -hmm. called him Gaga. She lived with us. That's my mom's mom. And then on the other side of the family had my dad's parents and they were they lived about a mile away from us. So being around these two ladies, I from a really young age, I wanted to be like them. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like they really were the connection between me and my identity. Mm -hmm. When a lot of the places that we lived, we I, I would be the only native person in my class. And so when we'd study, if there, the topic came up, you know, um, and at Thanksgiving, all those mm -hmm. pilgrims and Indians, right? And everyone looks at me because I'm the Indian. Yeah. So there's a lot of pressure in that. You can either totally resist it or you can embrace it. And my mom helped me to embrace it. And she told me, this is what you say in school. Mm -hmm. And this is why this is like this. And from my grandmothers, I got more explanation. This is why this is like this. And this is how it's done. So I learned how to sew my our most traditional clothing from my grandmother on my dad's side because she could make an entire man's shirt with no scissors. Each piece of her patterns, she ripped mm -hmm. the fabric into the shape that she needed. And that was a way that ladies had been sewing since they first got cloth yeah. to work with. And then on the other side, my, my Gaga who lived with us, she was beading. And she was still able to bead when I was young. And so every time she'd bead, I'd come and I'd just stare at what she was doing and I wanted to do it. And finally she said, okay, I'm not gonna always be able to see as good as I do now. Mm -hmm. Someday you're gonna have to make all your own stuff for yourself because she had dressed us. She made mm -hmm. all of our traditional regalia for us. Every year when we'd go back to her house uh, in Nebraska for the powwow, she'd have little outfits made for us so we could dance at the powwow. So when she came to live with us, then I started to learn from her how to bead. And her eyes were bad, so by this time so she would tell me how to do it so I would just listen and I would try to do it how she would tell me and then I showed her so one of the processes she was teaching me was uh, a lot of people call it peyote stitch mm -hmm. it goes around and it's one bead at a time mm -hmm. so I started doing it and I did a few rows and then I showed her and she said oh yeah that's really good but you're going backwards <laughs> because she said she co goes yeah. toward herself, but I was going away. And later we figured out that's because my mom was left-handed. Mm -hmm. So when my mom would help me, she would show me completely yeah. opposite. But ever since then, I've always done in the same direction. So I don't know how everybody else is wrapping ropes when they wrap ropes, but I'm going this mm -hmm. way. And when I make my medallions, I'm going this way. 
So always I'm doing it backwards. Yeah. yeah. But I can't change. <laughs> I try. I can't change. Well, who, who says it's backwards? Maybe that's the correct yeah. way and yeah, everyone else is doing it wrong. <laughs> so what would you tell um, young artists or artisans that are starting out and maybe want to do what you do? Well, one thing that I always tell young people, I'm, I'm so lucky I get to do beading classes. I was even so lucky I got to do beading classes with um, Lindsay Knight. Mm, she's, mm -hmm. she's equal. Yeah. I did some beading classes with her for White Buffalo Lodge, and we did them online so people you know, could have that little bit of connection. And what I said was, to young people, if you're just starting to try to bead, I always tell them, the first thing you make, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even plan for it to be wonderful. It's going to be ugly. You're going to make it, you can probably throw it away. Yeah. The second one will be a little bit better. The third one is going to be even better. And by the fourth one, you're going to be like, I'm an expert. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I say. I say, you just have to try mm -hmm. more than once and eventually you'll get it. And if you can get it, you will love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's a question that I ask all of the guests um, that I have on here is, do you see reconciliation in the arts? Or do you think um, there's a, a place for reconciliation in the arts? My goal in making things is always to make my own people curious mm -hmm. about who they are, where they came from, the people that they came from so that they could draw strength from that but my other goal secondary goal would be that non-indigenous people would look at them and see our beauty our strength and see how creative and how important our personal ideas mm -hmm. and beliefs are to us and maybe be curious about well, you know, why do they have these beliefs? Mm -hmm. What do they come from? Because our beliefs come from the Creator. Mm -hmm. Everything that we need to live, the Creator gave us. The Creator, you might call Him God, you might call Him by another name, but there's just one. And that's where, that's the source of all the things we need to live. If we could go out here on Lanaskewin, we could find food for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We could find medicines for all the things that are wrong with us. We would find peace for our emotional selves. And we would find fun and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And all those things are out there for us. It's just for us to try to preserve that. Now as indigenous people, this is one example of something that we have to do together. Mm -hmm. And that's what reconciliation is. Something we have to do together. Sometimes in this whole reconciliation process, it comes about that uh, non-Indigenous people will look at us and say, well, but what do you, what do you want us to do? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I just would say, you know, you have to look deep inside yes, yourself. Yeah. You have to look deep inside yourself. And that's where the truth part comes in. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? What has been wrong? For all these years and why is it still wrong mm -hmm. and all those things that are still wrong what's your part in it yeah what do you have to change yeah and all people can change all people have the capacity to change we can also change our organizations our mm -hmm. institutions we can change our laws we can change the way that we do all of those things and they can become a place where people can actually work together evenly and fairly. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to make a way for our young, little young people who are just coming up. They'll be able to come through the school system and have every opportunity there for them mm -hmm. that takes advantage of their strengths, their skills, the way they look at the world. And when they grow up, they'll be strong, mm -hmm. proud of themselves, and, and they'll do good things in the world. Hate will continue to turn them away from their own strengths and their own potential. And if we can just uh, get that hate out of our institutions and organizations, then they'll have a much better chance at life. Mm -hmm. That's what I see as reconciliation. And 
and just presenting something to people that they will look at that will make them curious or give them better understanding mm -hmm. of indigenous people. That's what I'm hoping will be my part in reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Is that, or I'll tell them. Yeah. Uh, if someone <laughs> asks me, I will just tell you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so those teachings, how important it is, is it that those teachings are passed down to younger generations so that they can pass those down? Oh, that is vitally important. Mm -hmm. When I was learning from my grandma, I didn't even think about that. Uh, and, and for sure, I know as I was growing up, I thought, well, somebody is going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so there are parts that I regret I didn't learn enough about. Mm -hmm. There are things I don't know about my own relatives that uh, I know they told me about and, and I've either forgotten or wasn't listening very good mm -hmm. at the beginning. And I think, how can we restore that? How are we ever going to get that back? Yeah. And one way is to talk because the things I don't know, probably my cousin knows or mm -hmm. somebody else knows and to bring all of our knowledge back together because it it will be gone. Mm -hmm. It will be gone. And unlike all the other cu cultures that live here in North America now, we can't go back someplace and, yeah. and try to get it back. People still speak Ukrainian in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. People still speak French in, in France. But our languages will be gone. Mm -hmm. There's not another place we can go to try to learn it. Mm -hmm. So I continue to try to learn. Um, my parents had two different languages that were not understandable to each other, so they couldn't talk to each other. But since I've been here, I spend a lot more time in ceremony with my husband and to hear him saying the prayers mm -hmm. and to hear him and his relatives talking together, I'm learning more and yeah. more. And it makes me curious about my own languages, so I go back and I mm -hmm. and I talk to my cousins or I do research and I find out, oh, this is how we say this, this is how we say that. And I remember things from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. My grandma used to always say this. What did, What was it? What was she saying when she was saying that? And I'll check with my cousins. Sometimes it's good things and sometimes <laughs> it's not that good. One example of that would be, she would always say, and, and she had kind of like a tone, a sing-song kind of tone. Na cha cafe. And I thought, what was that? What? She said it all the time. It means big ears. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess when her and my mom were trying to secretly talk, yeah. they would talk in their language because we were little kids and we have big ears yeah. and we'll hear what they're saying. Yeah. But when they talked in their language, then we, we didn't know what they were mm -hmm. saying. But I heard that all the time. <laughs> Well, that's kind of the the problem with the oral traditions is if they're not passed down, then we lose them. So, right. like, you know, what can we do to ensure that the people who know the language, um, we are able to preserve that and pass it down onto young people? And maybe um, I think part of the problem is just that Indigenous people maybe are raised in a place where they're not proud to, to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. So how can we, you know, at the very beginning be like, these are the teachings, and I want you to be proud of them and to continue to learn them. I guess, like, how do we, how do we start there? The, I mean, the youth is so important. So that's right. that's kind of right. that's how future generations are going, and even um, like settler youth. It's important to also make sure that they're taught these histories mm -hmm. so that they're not given one side of the story. And uh, I think that's also a part in reconciliation. It's just education. It is. At, like the very beginning before we get to the point where it's like they're not even listening anymore. Right, right. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Uh, when I first was asked to come into the schools and work, uh, they invited me as their elder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified. But I thought, but I am a grandma. Mm -hmm. So I'll come in as a grandma. And I thought, well, if I'm going to come in as a grandma, I want them to have the experience that I had. Mm -hmm. And I had a grandma who never spoke English, but every day of her life, she wore her traditional mm -hmm. dress. So it was a skirt, but it was also a little a blouse and always cotton calico kind of designs on it. And I thought I want them to have that experience. And so I decided every day I would wear a skirt. Mm -hmm. And so then what I found was when I'm in the neighborhood, 
I'm wearing this skirt, other people connect to that. Mm -hmm. They don't have to wear the skirt themselves too, but they show respect to mm -hmm. me when I'm in the neighborhood and I'm wearing skirts. And then I start to go out in the community because from school I gotta go do errands, so I'm out in the community. And uh, I found the response was really positive. Mm -hmm. I thought it was gonna be kind of like, phew, why is she wearing that skirt? You know, or something, yeah. something negative or, or othering, you know, yeah. like, you know, people giving me kind of looks, but maybe there were, and maybe I just learned how to not see that. Yeah. And now I just see the positive. People give good response to it. Uh, people say my skirts are beautiful mm -hmm. or else one lady, a really old lady came over to me in the market mall and she said, she said, you look regal. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> so I thought that was so nice. Yeah. Because when she, actually, when she was walking towards me, I was like, oh no. <laughs> oh no. What's she going to say? <laughs> She's going to tell me to get out of here yeah. or something. But she did. She said, you look regal. So that's a little part of it. Mm -hmm. That's if I can go to McDonald's wearing a skirt and and people are still treating me okay, then I I think that helps us a little mm -hmm. bit and helps young people to see that who they are is important mm -hmm. and that it's valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want them to feel because just think of all the institutions we've had to live under, the Indian agent, residential school where the way we were brought up the way we grew our language our hair everything about us we were told that's wrong mm -hmm. it's wrong it's not good enough you have to be a different way and so now we're reinstituting for ourselves mm -hmm. we're going to be the way that we are and we're still going to go about our business mm -hmm. in our original home and so in the schools, the young people see that, and the, there are newcomers, mm -hmm. and they can't, might dress a little bit different. Mm -hmm. The girls are wearing the hijab, and I feel like we connect too, mm -hmm. because we both have things about us. They're different, yeah. but they're in that same setting. Mm -hmm. And so I think that goes a long way too. And I, I want to help people to understand who we are as indigenous people, and see the positive in us, but also see why it would be harmful to be racist or to have mm -hmm. hate. And I always say, no one's ever racist against their own friends. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step. We try to be friends. Yeah. 